Welcome to the Love Lessons Podcast, a space for you to invest in your most important relationships 20 minutes at a time. Today, I sit down with consultant psychiatrist and director of the Mind and Soul Foundation, Dr. Chichi Aboya. And together we talk about uh, mental health, neurodiversity, and how we build resilience. Here it is. Chichi, welcome to the Love Lessons Podcast. Thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here. I think this is the first time I've actually sat down with a, a Harley Street consultant psychiatrist. I feel um, feel very excited about what I'm going to like discover about myself through this conversation with you. Stop it, Dave. Uh, firstly, you're interviewing me, uh, we should say. Uh, normally, I'm the one asking the questions. Secondly, I need to emphasize I'm not a mind reader. I don't have any special powers. As a medically trained doctor, my role is to assess and diagnose and treat mental health conditions. I can only do that with the information I'm given. So I don't have this ability just to uh, eyeball somebody and know what's going on in their life. Um, So it's a sort of um, party stopper comment when I mention that I'm a psychiatrist. I think maybe we come second to priests in terms of um, just getting uh, people taking a step back once they hear what you do. Um, but I, I don't have the ability to, to figure out what people are thinking unless they're telling me. It's one of the big misconceptions. Well, I'm, I'm relieved you're not a mind reader. And um, yeah, it's quite exciting. The psychiatrist and the priest having a conversation. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Can we start, um, Chi Chi, um, talking about mental health? Um, uh, people have described the, the season we're in as like a mental health kind of like pandemic. Um, wh- what does it mean to be m- like mentally healthy? Uh, Because that must be the goal, right? That we, each of us, are increasingly moving towards being like mentally healthy. But what does that mean, and what does that look like? It's a great question because although it may seem that that's a a reasonable goal, I think we have to ask ourselves the question as mental health professionals whether that's what we go about doing day in day out. Because I think there is quite a lot of firefighting, and ultimately, as a psychiatrist, my role is more to treat mental illness. So if you like, that's quite far downstream when problems have manifested and people are really struggling. We talk a lot about prevention and your question alludes to the fact that maybe if we can focus a bit more on being healthier, it will minimise the risk of us experiencing episodes of mental ill health. Now, to some extent, some of the conditions that I treat may have very much a biological basis So some conditions run in families, and there isn't much you can do about that. Although um, certain conditions will be more present, maybe under significant stress. So to what extent can we actually modify the environment? I think that's, that's a huge question to answer. I think there are some things we can do to be mentally healthy. And what does that really mean? I love the concept. So rather than getting into specific mental health conditions, the concept of Uh, thriving and I think that speaks to um, living your life to the full Um, one of the terms I hate hearing is living your best life and I I feel it's it's very superficial but there's something about fulfilling your potential whether that's in school or work or with friendships and relationships going about your daily business but I think there's also something about the awareness of when things are slightly out of kilter because we're probably setting ourselves up for failure if the goal is to have this stress-free, perfect, idyllic lifestyle. Um, I think particularly in a Christian context, um, a lot of personal growth comes through adversity. And resilience is a term that is spouted about very much. I think a lot of people want to have the elements of resilience, but not necessarily to go through the adversity to arrive at that point. So it's not about focusing on the outcomes it's just having the awareness to understand yourself better understand the environment and the interplay between the two mm. how resilience is interesting how do you how would you define resilience like what what is it there are many different definitions and um i think a simple definition is that bounce back ability mm-hmm. um so when adversity hits you're you're not flattened by it But as I mentioned, there's something about being able to grow through adversity as well. And so that's more than bouncing back. And it's actually about using experiences as a learning opportunity 
and um, developing um, a degree of grit that sees you forward. And do you think resilience and grit are things that someone just has, or do you think it's um, it's a muscle that you can develop? And and if so, how do you go about becoming more resilient or more more gritty? Nobody knows the answer to that question. Um, there are different theories about resilience. Um, so there's one called the inoculation theory. So inoculation refers to when you're getting a jab. And the idea is that if you've experienced some adversity in the past, through experience, you're better prepared for a future adverse event. Um, we know that that isn't always the case. There are situations where actually people who've experienced adversity are more vulnerable um, when faced with further danger. There's an idea that certain uh, family systems um, are more resilient and so they give people a better opportunity. So that's called the family systems theory. And then there are theories around um, just our makeup and whether some people are just inherently more resilient. But there is no um, one narrative that really pervades or tells us what works. I think one of the traps, actually, uh, when we think about resilience, and I sometimes talk about resilience in an organizational context, is that we drill it down to the individual. And that's a big mistake because it suggests that if I give you a, a nice toolkit and you go away and adhere to that toolkit, you will be more resilient. And if you're not resilient, well, you've done something wrong. There's something fundamentally wrong with you. But I mentioned that interplay between ourselves and the environment. So if I'm your boss, how am I enabling that environment um, in a way that enables you to thrive? Um, so we need to think about organizational resilience as well um, and, and thinking about how we um, support each other. And again, in, in contemporary society, a lot of the focus is on the self. And I think we're losing that element of what it means to be part of a community and how it's not all about us. And then in a Christian context, of course it isn't purely about us. It's um, actually in many ways surrendering to God and allowing him um, to do his work and to show his strength through our weakness. But again, that's not a very popular approach to take mm. because so many of the messages we're, we're receiving about living your best life and doing what you can and taking control of things. Um, so I think it's, it's important to be aware of different perspectives, but also to think in a Christian context about uh, what scripture actually has to say about these factors. Mm. Just for anyone listening who they are in a moment in their life where they feel like I need, I need a level of resilience in my, um, relationships maybe my parenting in my workplace in my I think what kind of what you're touching on is there's not there's not one way to fix it but it I would imagine there's kind of there's something about the interior life that they need to tend to and then also something kind of external I don't know if that's kind of a, a practice or and this probably links into our overall conversation around mental health of like things that people can do that actually do um, build resilience so what, yeah, what would you say to someone who is listening and they're thinking, Chi Chi, please help me. You know, if I could have 20 minutes with you um, in your surgery to talk through how I can become more resilient. Uh, interior life, external practices, what would you, where would you start? There wouldn't be a one size fits all approach that so goes back to the mind reading um, thing that we started with. Um, I'd need to examine with that individual what resources do they have available uh, and that might be, as you said, their internal makeup, um, the way they, they think about the world, but also people they can access maybe within their support network. I think the other thing which is left out of this conversation, though, is um, accepting sometimes when things are tough. And again, from a Christian perspective, lamentation is, is something that we we don't talk about enough but maybe the world doesn't hear about enough and so understanding that frustration and um, a range of emotions are, are normal as well anxiety in itself is a normal phenomenon and 
whilst we as professionals want to reduce people's anxiety levels, I think we've got to, particularly when we're supporting young people and we're seeing lots of challenges that young people are facing, it's also helping them to navigate through what is sometimes a normal course of events. And being anxious or um, expressing emotions in different situations isn't in and of itself a problem. Mm. It's just enabling people to have that range of responses. Mm. So I think um, it's okay sometimes when it's tough. Mm. Um, and um, understanding that that's the starting point. Um, the, other, the other pet hate I have is um, in terms of mantras, you know, fake it till you make it. Um, this idea that if you just put your mind to something and almost ignore the circumstances you're facing, eventually things will turn around. Um, whilst I can understand the sentiment behind it, I think it's much more helpful to understand the, the challenges that one is facing and the enormity of a, a situation that lots of my patients find themselves in. But then you can still realistically... Um, be forward thinking, be goal oriented and work your way out of it. You don't need to pretend mm. that it's not happening. I, I don't think that's very helpful mm. as an approach. To, to avoid the fake it till you make it um, way of living uh, and to adopt your point about kind of acceptance, um, there's probably a moment where someone realizes, oh, I'm on a trajectory here which is not going the right way. Like, how, with, with our mental health, how do you. Um, how do you spot when your mental health is declining? Like, are there some like some telltale signs that there may be someone listening who um, they wouldn't say they're a particularly kind of anxious person, or they they're not um, uh, in need of kind of a, a one-to-one session with someone? But there must be kind of a vast number of people in the population who, how would they recognise? Okay, no, I need to take this seriously. This is a moment where I need to um, get some help. And then would there be certain things you would like them to engage in and check they have in their life um, that might stop, might move from a downwards trajectory to an, to an upward one? So I introduced that term thriving, but perhaps didn't explain exactly what I meant. So, you know, Dave, when you get those days where you walk into work, you're sort of bounding in, you feel good, you feel energetic, um, you're probably taking good care of nutrition, I imagine you're getting adequate sleep. Your relationships are in a good enough place. So you're connecting with family and friends. Um, so there are certain um, controllables there that you sort of taken care of at baseline. And then you've got that outward um, uh, outlook in that you're not just thinking about yourself. You're thinking about your colleagues. You're maybe making eye contact with people on the tube or connecting with people as you, as you leave your house. Those are some of the markers of somebody who might be thriving. And the opposite of that is when someone's languishing. So the focus is on oneself. And then you might get into a pattern of thinking that is very ruminative. So just getting preoccupied with certain themes. And sometimes that's looking back and looking forward but not being in the present so worrying about something that you've done or that you fundamentally can't change anything about because it was in the past but you can't get over it worrying about the future even though it might be quite some way away and not actually living in the present um, alongside that you may not be in a good relationship with food you may not be sleeping adequately and there may be an imbalance between uh, maybe work and um, social activities, spending time with friends and families, connecting with other people, getting stimulated intellectually beyond work. Um, so I would say that in that situation, that's when you're in that at-risk zone. Uh, and that's where people may experience phenomena such as burnout. They may be at risk of having an episode of uh, depression or anxiety so just paying attention to some of these things that we hear a lot about admittedly some of which are in our control but also just some markers um, I remember um, there's a colleague at work who sadly passed away last year and um, 
there are a few times on a Monday morning, she'd say, oh, hi, Dr. Aboire, you look really tired. And I'd say, thank you. It's nine o'clock on a Monday. It's just what I needed to hear. Um, but actually, I really appreciated having someone who could just see hmm, something not quite right about you. And it goes back to this sense of having a community around us, people that can speak truth to you, be very open with you. Uh, and that, that did uh, strike a chord with me. And I thought, gosh, if someone else is picking that up, maybe I do need to think about how much rest I get this next evening. So sometimes it's things that we're doing ourselves in terms of having this awareness. Other times you need other people that you're accountable to that can just tell you what they're seeing as well. So if you're a bit irritable, for example, if two or three people have said that, it's probably something in that. Hmm. Can I just pick up, you mentioned about burnout. And I think um, in London, fast pace, um, I think, high capacity and drive is something that's really celebrated here um how do you avoid or like what what is burnout it, and how do you guard or or, or build against it because i think we must all be kind of testing our capacity like how far can we push or how how much could we achieve in our one precious life and yet so often you hear of people who have done that but then have had to What's that phrase if you don't make time for your wellness you'll be forced to make time for your illness yeah like how how do you be people who avoid burnout yeah what, what is it and how do we how do we avoid it i think you hit the nail on the head in in that description where the mindset is often how much can one fit in um i think we should have an appreciation that time is the name of the game here and we have uh, a fixed amount of time how often do we find ourselves thinking, oh, I wish there was an eighth day of the week. <laughs> then I would have rested properly. Um, but that's the whole point. We have to challenge ourselves within the parameters that are available to us. And the danger is that we look at our outward performance. So that might be your performance at work or, or how others perceive you are. That then is the marker of, oh yeah, he's, he's quite well. Actually, what's happening is all the ingredients for burnout are building during that time. So the very things that I've talked about in terms of maybe not adhering to good sleep hygiene, you can get away with it and you might get away with it time and time again. But at some point, you're going to hit a cliff edge. And when that comes, the, the buildup could have been months or years, but the cliff edge is where your performance will drop very dramatically over a period of days and that's where that irritability the loss of connection with maybe where you spend most of your time which might be at home might be at work really hits home and there's a massive sense of disconnection a lack of enjoyment which may be as a result of not really engaging in any sort of routine outside of where that main activity lies so not engaging in sports not um, engaging your mind and maybe going to an art exhibition or reading a book. It could be all sorts of things or going for a bike ride. You'll get away with it in the short term. But burnout is where things have caught up with you, basically. Um, Chichi, let's zoom out from kind of the individual to um, the kind of the meta. Like what, with the patients that you're seeing, I guess you have a good insight in terms of the trends um, with with mental health, what are you seeing? Like, and how how has that landscape shifted over the last um, couple of years? Yeah, it's a great question, Dave, and it's always one I'm cautious about asking because although I see lots of people, I'm one individual, and so um, sometimes there's maybe some randomness to whatever I'm seeing. But I do think I've got my finger on the pulse, and you just get a sense of um, what's going on. But also from speaking to colleagues. Um, and staying abreast of, of what's going on in the field. I think we're at a time where, um, although we're a few years out from COVID, certain phenomena um, over the last few years have emerged. Uh, my subspecialty is ADHD. ADHD is what we call a neurodevelopmental disorder. So it's to do with the way in which the brain is wired. And it used to be the thinking that it was a childhood condition and you grew out of it. 
but actually there's extensive research um, that shows that um, for a decent proportion of people, those symptoms continue to varying degrees in their adult life. There's been a massive upsurge over the last decade, and I'd say even in the last five years, year on year, there's been exponential growth in the demand for assessments. So the question is, why has that happened? And one of the, one of the issues there is around um, what happened during the pandemic when people were at home, they were forced to slow down. And so for some people working from home, the difficulties that um, characterize ADHD, like not being able to focus and sustain attention became very apparent. And there's also a thing called TikTok, uh, which took off around then. And so lots of, actually, I think it was a positive, lots of um, public attention on some of those symptoms, so greater awareness about this condition. That would be one example. I'd say uh, another thing that happened around that time, um, substance misuse and alcohol use, really interesting. I think we're seeing generational trends there. So uh, with lockdown and a lack of social activities, uh, the alcohol consumption for some people went through the roof, frankly. Um, people were bored, uh, there was easy access to alcohol, and in some cases that's persisted and become really problematic. However, other people went the other direction and um, significantly reduced their alcohol intake. And I think younger people were seeing that they're perhaps less likely to, um, to consume alcohol um, in large quantities in the way that our generation have. Sticking with young people, I'd say that there are challenges that we continue to see um, affecting uh, adolescents and young adults. Uh, we know that rates of self-harming, particularly amongst adolescent girls and young women, have really gone up over a generation, uh, and that continues to be a challenge. Um, and it's the usual suspects, I think, in terms of the sorts of narratives that are out there, the impact of social media, um, and the way in which social networks are being formed in a slightly different way to our generation. And I think for young men, uh, similarly, um, lots of concerns about body image, so we're seeing rising rates of eating disorders amongst young men. Um, I keep referring to different generations, Dave. You and I, of course, uh, we must accept that we are not part of that younger generation. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a bit closer than you are. Oh, okay, if you want to go there, we can do. But you are the one, when we spoke the other day, you told me about uh, your excitement at getting a sprinkler. Oh, so that's low. You're positively you... <laughs> middle-aged, my friend. So it's a water, nice try. It's a water irrigation system, not a spring. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Chichi, let's, um, let's just move on quickly. In fact, move back just um, to your, your sub-specialism, um, ADHD. Um, just firstly, f um, just say a bit more about the symptoms that people um, who suffer with ADHD experience. I think that's helpful both, both for those who who have it to understand it perhaps a bit better but also those who are working with um, colleagues who have ADHD just to try and understand the world that they're living in just tell us more about the, the symptoms and the um, the effects of, of ADHD on the body quick caveat I think one of the the dangers that we have is that the symptoms of ADHD are quite common so um, I would emphasize the need um, for this to be properly examined the the inconvenient truth is that the demand is huge and so waiting lists are really long. Um, however, having said all that, um, I said it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. So there's a lack of uh, the neurotransmitter or chemical messenger dopamine in two main pathways in the brain. And one of those leads to a cluster of symptoms that we refer to as inattention. So that's getting easily distracted, not being able to focus forgetting things, making lots of silly mistakes. Bear in mind, these aren't just things that would have occurred for a week or a month. It would have taken place over years going back to childhood. And so that's what I would be exploring when I'm assessing someone. And I would, um, you'll be interested to know, Dave, I, I speak to relatives um, and try and ask what, uh, what the, the patient was like when they were at school and I go through school reports. And so I'm looking for those symptoms being evident in some of the teacher's comments. 
Um, so that's the inattentive symptoms, but then there are hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. So things like being very fidgety, very restless, talking too much, interrupting others, having super high energy levels. As you can imagine, these are common. They can also occur in other conditions. So as a psychiatrist, I'm also looking to exclude other mental health conditions, such as anxiety disorders, when people are very anxious, they might fidget a lot, they may be quite impulsive as well. I assume though, with, with ADHD, maybe in a similar way to dyslexia, that there'll be some things that someone who has dyslexia finds harder, but then there are other things that they, they uh, to use your word, really kind of thrive and flourish in, and something that they bring to a team that actually those who don't have dyslexia may not have to such a high... Is the same true with, with ADHD? 100%, and I'm glad that you asked that, because even for someone um, who's aware of that, I think we sometimes do focus too much on the things people struggle with, and there can be real strengths. So I think that ability to think outside the box, to be creative, to challenge the status quo, these can be real strengths of people with ADHD, because... It is about different wiring and we get diversity of thinking um, due to our different personalities. So it's, it's a balancing act because we want people to have these strengths, but also people tend to seek help where there are areas of challenge. So often the situation is that someone is maybe struggling at university, they might be finding it hard to get coursework done in in time or it's just really hard to focus on a lecture and in the workplace um, and it's often when people go from being in school where it's fairly straightforward you know you go from classroom a to classroom b where everyone else has gone to having to be at university where you've got to organize your own time and then be at the workplace where you've probably moved out of home and you have a lot more responsibility so sometimes the environment plays a role in that you don't see it when people are younger as much um, and then it really comes to the fore as they get older and have more responsibility. Mm. But there can be strengths, absolutely. Uh, again, zooming out from ADHD and um, another word which, um, again, I think it's it spoken about a lot at the moment is neurodiversity. Yeah. Um, is, that kind of the, that's, is that the heading under which um, ADHD would, would sit? Yeah, so ADHD is one of several neurodiverse conditions. You mentioned dyslexia. There's another condition called developmental coordination disorder. That's better known as dyspraxia, so where people struggle with their coordination. Autism spectrum disorder uh, is another neurodiverse condition, and there are a few others. So some people have more than one of those conditions. Some people have little bits and pieces of a few of them. And so it's the umbrella term that um, characterizes all of those conditions. And then um, you mentioned already about anxiety. And uh, is it right that anxiety is, is one of the more kind of common um, things that people face? Um, what is anxiety? And uh, for those listening who've, who experience it, probably to differing degrees, um, what would your kind of advice be to them in terms of um, uh, confronting it or, 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 yeah. What is anxiety is, um, is a good starting point and not an easy question to answer. Um, and again, I have to think as a psychiatrist, am I seeing anxiety? Am I seeing an anxiety disorder? So just like any other doctor, I'm trying to diagnose conditions. So you may want to think of that as giving someone a label. And that sounds like a, a bad thing to do, but actually it can be very positive because with a label, we can think about evidence-based treatments. It doesn't necessarily mean medication. And actually I'd argue that for anxiety disorders, the mainstay of treatment tends to be talking therapy number one and medication number two. So anxiety in and of itself is not a condition. It's a normal state um, whereby there may be certain thoughts, feelings or behavior that arise, um, usually in response to stress or uncomfortable situations. 
So anxiety can, broadly speaking, manifest physically and psychologically. So if you think about, Dave, um, maybe a sporting event when you were at school, um, and if you were up against someone like me, you would have been nervous because you'd be thinking, oh man, he's quick. He's going to beat me at this 100 meter race. <laughs> Your heart would have been pounding. You might have, been, uh, you might have had sweaty palms. Uh, you might have had a, a knot in your abdomen. Those are physical manifestations of anxiety. Um, when I then beat you badly um, in front of all your, your friends, you may um, have gone home that night and analyzed the race. You yeah. would have cried. <laughs> you would have been really upset. And you, it may just have played again in your mind the next day and the day after and the day after. So we're now moving into that territory where... Um, anxiety before uh, something that's important to you is normal where it starts to persist and then you're thinking about it a lot it might interfere with your sleep um, it might make you withdrawn so if you didn't want to go into school the next day um, that might be a form of social anxiety or even if you start to get the physical symptoms when objectively nothing scary is happening we call that anticipatory anxiety then we're moving into the territory um, that i would say is more of that clinical anxiety um, so when it's very pervasive persistent and problematic then we've got an issue but anxiety in and of itself can be a good thing and when a person reaches that stage what would your advice be to them if they've heard you just talk through that scenario and thinking, gosh, I've got a number of those scenarios in my mind that have shifted the way I now behave and, and work at home, what would a next step be, be for them? In any of these situations, um, it's not a straightforward thing of saying, just go get help. Um, people have different levels of understanding of these conditions um, and they may have already tried uh, one or two things. So... Again, it's about what resources one has. So, for example, at a very simple level, there are things that we can do to control levels of anxiety. Um, what I mean by this is that we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system getting into overdrive. And so if one is maybe prone to having that sense of panic, the simple thing we can do is actually control our breathing rate. And by doing so, we're now driving the parasympathetic nervous system or the rest and digest system. So that, that's pushing blood into um, uh, our organs and it's slowing down our heart rate. Uh, and these are things that then help us to feel a lot calmer. In some instances, uh, people may then need um, some professional help. And as I said, that's often more... Uh, in the talking therapy realm, first and foremost. Uh, and in some cases, people can self-refer for some counselling support or therapy. And then if, if it's persisting, it might be that you need to go and seek some help from your GP. It's certainly not inevitable um, that one needs medication. I think we need to understand what are the things that are really driving anxiety. So it might be work-related stress. And actually, it's just thinking about what you can do about that situation. Is it something that you would speak to your line manager about? And maybe adjustments are made. And in some cases, that's the thing that's going to make the difference. Mm -hmm. So I think seeking some form of help, um, if it's persistent, is probably going to be a good thing. And remember that we have social networks and then there are professional networks. Mm -hmm. And it's effectively building that virtual team around yourself mm. that's key. And then, and then there's also, I guess, the, the faith network. Just say a bit about, for you, as both a, a Christian and a, a clinical psych psychiatrist, um, what impact does your faith have on how you think about mental health? So... I'd emphasize we're, we're human, just like everyone else. Um, so we're not immune to um, some of these challenges. Um, I've personally not experienced any major mental health episodes, but certainly 
uh, colleagues of mine have, and that can be a real strength actually, um, when clinicians have lived experience um, in terms of how they can connect with, with the people that they're seeing. Um, but certainly when we talk about things like anxiety, um, workplace stress, burnout, these are the things that we're all vulnerable to. Um, so I guess I think about what I do and then I think about how that impacts professionally. And the connection for me um, is that sense of role modeling. So I can't think of anything that I would encourage a patient to do that I wouldn't do myself when it's um, around advice to maintain healthy boundaries, to slow things down, um, to engage in the sorts of activities that help to, to keep people in check. The, the underpinning of that for me personally would be my faith. And um, I get a real sense of purpose from the work that I do. And therefore, I love it when people say that going to work doesn't feel like work. Um, I'd say that there are some aspects of my work that don't because the reality of what I do is that it is very intense. And even though I love it 95% of the time, even when I'm loving it, it can feel quite tiring. Um, it can be exhausting. There are lots of emails. There's lots of responsibility that come with my work. So um, for me, just generally having um, some spiritual disciplines um, as part of how I manage my time is really important. But I think also um, the perspective I have in terms of taking my work seriously and having um, a sense of responsibility to give my patients the best that I can, but knowing ultimately it's God who's in control, not really me, I'm just a vessel. And that's pretty liberating. I think in terms of situations I find myself in, I've always had quite a laid back approach um, so there's something about my temperament, but I'd also say that um, leaning on God has been really important for me. Um, so you were asking me uh, when we spoke earlier about any particular scriptures um, that have tended to resonate, and um, I won't have time to give the full backstory, but there was a particular poignant time right at the start of my career. I was on the other side of the world. I'd just been in a major disaster and um, I actually went to a Christian bookshop at the time and um, there was a poster in a different language with Proverbs 16 on it and it says we may make our plans but God has the final word and I think that's almost it sounds a bit cheesy but it's sort of a motto that I have I'm not a big fan on mantras and I don't stand in front of the mirror and tell myself I'm amazing or anything of that nature. But that's just one of those things that is quietly there in the background and I remind myself of. So it means that I don't feel too daunted in um, situations I find myself in. And I generally stay quite cool under pressure. And I think those are really important attributes given some of the, the complex situations I find myself in at work. Chichi, that's, that is so helpful. And um, I just want to kind of zoom out from Chichi as like the professional for a moment and just ask you about um, Chichi like the man. And um, as you say, you know, you're a, you're a, a talented sprinter. Um, Was. As we, wait, wait, wait. As we, let's be careful with that. You're a... Uh, I'm, I'm living in the past Professionally, <laughs> you know, you're smashing it. Um, lots of people could could look at you and say wow, he is like kind of, he's bossing it. He's, um, can I just ask you about kind of masculinity and about um, like, what, what does that mean to you? And do you, how, how do you live your, your life or seek to lead and live as a man in the world? Um, particularly, I guess, as a, as a Christian, is that, is that different from, from um, yeah, just say, say more about that. Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't say it's a, it's about trying to boss it. It's it's very much staying focused, and it sounds really cliche to say this, Dave, but there's something about 
being countercultural, not not for the sake of it, but sitting with the discomfort that comes from it, actually. And I'd say that's still a journey I'm on, um, and certainly one that's been quite meandering. I was just like many other young men. I went off to university. I was brought up in a in a Christian household, but I sort of um, I had an image of of one particular um, early night at university where um, there's sort of a Christian union stand and there's all the rugby lads in the other corner. And I I remember actually just thinking, oh, there's a part of me that kind of wants to be involved with the Christian union guys, but I was very much a lad um, and um, got sucked into a lot of that culture, good aspects of it and less good aspects of it, without a doubt. So I've kind of trodden that path of trying different elements of what it means to be a man but I think there was always that part of me that felt a little bit different and felt very maybe more intellectually mature and over a long period of time I would emphasize the spiritual maturity has come around so I definitely dispel that myth that I'm bossing it I've just over time work some stuff out and I'd say that the best analogy I could come up with is a bit like an onion being peeled and you kind of feel like oh yeah got rid of that layer we're good oh no there's another layer to go and that's probably been my journey that yeah. the maturity has come about very very slowly um, but yeah I do I do feel like I'm in a good place so my encouragement to others would be to have um that ability to sit with the discomfort because I think as I started to mature some people felt as though the old me was lost and they liked some elements of that but actually those are the bits of my personality I needed to shed say more about what it means though to be countercultural. like what are the things you're driving after that others may not be driving after or things that, that others are driving after that you're not Again, it, it, it sounds really cliche to talk about things like purpose, but just what drives you. And I think as a man, there's, there's a lot around maybe um, material success um, and striving to do more, going for growth, whatever that means in your, in your workplace, in your job title, if you run your own business, making everything bigger, bigger, more and more and more. And... Certainly for me, um, it's, it's actually about doing less a lot of the time. And I talked about managing time. There are lots of choices I've had to make. And um, I could work seven days a week um, and I'd still have demand that I couldn't meet. So it's about making those choices that there are better things, there are more important things that I want to spend my time with. That, I think, is in some ways going against the grain because so much of it is if you acquire more um, you give your family greater financial security you get a bigger house and so on and so forth and for me just sitting comfortably with what I have and knowing that um, I'm on, on the right path and having that security spiritually is way more important than, mm -hmm. than any of that well it's easy we want to say thank you to you because you're you're a role model to many. Uh, you're a role model to me, um, as you know, someone um, older and wiser. Um, I'll stop it. Then, I don't know about then, the older. The... We, we, we'll need to bring our passports, Dave. I, I think we need to clarify a few yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we want to say thank you to you, Chi Chi, for, for um, sharing with us. And um, I wonder, would you be willing to pray for, for us and for those listening as we, as we come to a, a close? Happy to do so. Lord, thank you uh, for these moments to share knowledge. Um, and ultimately, we are thankful for the love you have for all parts of us, for our mental health, for our physical health. Um, we are part of one body. And Lord, we, we think of those who may be struggling in these areas and that as a body, we can support them, lift them up and show them your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Love Lessons podcast. 
We'd love to encourage you to stay in touch through subscribing to our Relationships Roundup and following us on Instagram at Love Lessons London. And our encouragement to you is to keep investing in your most important relationships.